Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about what I think might happen to property prices, particularly in investment grade blue chip locations in 2021. Uh, In May, I wrote a blog after CBA released its bearish, admittedly worst case forecast that the property market or property prices would drop by 32%. Uh, In fact, in my blog in May, I said that they certainly won't drop by more than 10% and maybe not at all. Uh, and according to various uh, data sources, it uh, doesn't matter which one you use, um, RP Data, CoreLogic, uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, all of them are suggesting that the price drops to date are somewhere between 2 and 3%, uh, which is barely noteworthy given the market can drop, the share market can drop 2 or 3% in a day. And again, that is barely noteworthy. Uh, in On the 9th of September, so... About two weeks ago, the uh, CBA revised its forecast, admitting it got it wrong and said maybe prices will come off by around 10%. I still think they're wrong, again. Uh, and given that the the virus is uh, now under control in Melbourne and certainly, and certainly all other states, I thought it was an opportune time to share my forecast for next year. And it is my view that uh, well-established inner-city blue-chip suburbs, investment-grade locations, if you will, uh, will re- rebound strongly in 2021 and probably deliver double-digit returns, which obviously means uh, 10% or more. There's a few reasons uh, I form this view, and that's what I'd like to go through and talk about really for the rest of this podcast. I think the first and, and probably the most compelling thing is that COVID has hurt lower income earners and younger people uh, disproportionately. Um, The problem is that lower income earners and younger people are typically more vulnerable to the impact of COVID and the lockdowns and restrictions and so forth. They tend to work in occupations that don't really lend themselves to working from home. You know, if you're a cleaner, an office cleaner, for example, uh, it's not like you can do that from home. Uh, And in addition, uh, industries such as hospitality, travel and tourism and so forth have been severely impacted, especially in Melbourne, uh, and they tend to employ uh, lower income workers and a a lot more younger workers as well. Uh, And unfortunately, it has disproportionately affected uh, those that are probably the most financially vulnerable in our community, which is uh, distressing and unfortunate. But the reality is that there's a, a much higher proportion of medical, middle and higher income earners that um, are, are either, one, likely to recover their income back to pre-COVID levels very, very quickly, uh, or haven't been in a situation where they've been that severely impacted, or in fact, there is a substantial cohort that uh, hasn't been impacted at all. If anything, their financial position is stronger than today. And that's because their income remains unaffected, but their discretionary expenditure has been reduced. It's it's been forced to they've been forced to reduce it because they're eating out less. Uh, there's no international holidays, and certainly interest rates are at all time lows, which puts or leaves more money in their pockets. Uh, and these people have either accelerated debt repayments or accumulated uh, a larger amount of cash savings. And I speak from experience, and the vast majority of my clients have been not been impacted by COVID. The vast majority, in fact, I would count on a hand uh, the advisory clients that I have that have been adversely impact, impacted. So there is a very strong cohort, and probably the best evidence of the strength, the financial strength of this cohort, cohort is um, credit card data that's compiled by the banks. Uh, and a couple of banks publish this uh, data almost weekly. Uh, it's uh, state-by-state data. It's divided into categories. And the good thing about it is it gives us real-time, up-to-date information about what people are doing with their money. Uh, and for a while now, probably for at least the last two or three months, spending as a, as a total amount is up about 4 to 5% compared to last year. 
Now, of course, that's going to different categories, to, uh, uh, consumer discretionary, for example, and that's why JB Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman are doing so in Bunnings. So West Farmers are doing incredibly well. Um, so they're spending on different things, but as a total level. Now, that's that, that tells us two things. Firstly, they've got money to spend, and look, part of that could be JobKeeper as well, but but I think after you allow for its impact, uh, that wouldn't uh, wouldn't be responsible for the total uh, increase in consumer spending, uh, and uh, and obviously they're spending on different things. So more dis- consumer discretionary, as I said, uh, certainly less on travel and tourism uh, and hospitality and those sorts of things. Uh, but it shows that uh, certainly we know that some people have been severely impacted; they've lost their jobs. Uh, you know, they're, they're um, uh, in, a, in a really awkward uh, and challenging financial situation. Uh, but it shows that there is a larger cohort and that cohort has enough financial power uh, to more than make up for the people that have been impacted. And that kind of makes sense if we assume that the vast majority of people that are impacted are lower income earners and therefore contributing less uh, to overall consumer expenditure. Uh, and this thematic uh, also will translate to the property market, I think. So that is that the cohort that have been, uh, haven't been impacted uh, will be able to generate or provide enough demand for housing uh, to soak up any stock that is on the market. And therefore, uh, we probably won't see prices reduce and that will create price inflation. The second element is that low interest rates inflate asset prices. So it's a generally accepted principle that lower interest rates do result in higher asset values. And if we apply that to the share market, which is a really logical argument to make, is that if a company is able to secure capital at a lower interest rate to fund growth, its profits are going to be higher because it grows faster and the cost of capital is substantially low. Uh, And so therefore the company as as an asset is now worth more because it's driving more profit. And this, this concept applies to property as well. If money is cheap, then it costs less to hold assets and holding all other factors uh, constant, uh, the value of those assets will appreciate. I wrote a blog back in May which highlighted that uh, in many cases it's cheaper to own property now than to rent it and that just defies logic and which means that it will encourage more renters to start buying, uh, assuming their financial situation allows it. And that's almost certainly going to increase the demand for property and therefore translate into potentially higher prices. And I think the the most persuasive factor here or to to note of really is the fact that the RBA has come out and said that they don't think they're going to change the cash rate for at least three years, at least three years, uh, and however, m- most economists think that interest rates will remain lower for even longer than that. So the protracted low interest rate outlook uh, will, I think, stimulate a lot more people. Quite often people have difficulty thinking in very long terms, like 10 years, 20 years. So quite often they think of one, two, five years perhaps. And so if we think interest rates are going to be between 2 and 3% for the next five years, That will stimulate, I'm not saying it should, but it will stimulate people to make uh, decisions around purchasing property rather than renting it or to invest. The third element is the supply shortage and it shouldn't be ignored. On a national level, uh, listings have averaged around 300,000, so that's 300,000 dwellings uh, are listed for sale uh, and that's been the average this year, this calendar year, uh, and the average hasn't been that low since August 2010. And, and certainly in some locations, particularly around Melbourne, uh, listings are 30 to 50% down compared to previous years. And that makes sense, right, because uh, really since Stage 4 lockdowns in Melbourne were enforced in early August, the property market has all but been closed. I mean, you certainly hear people buying property sight unseen. That's happening but not in uh, a large volume in terms of uh, number of units, number of properties sold. Uh, Listings will eventually increase gradually over the next uh, six to nine months, I'm sure. But the reality is that most people won't feel confident putting their property on the market until several months of very buoyant results. And this is just a common situation of herd mentality. We feel uneasy until everyone else stops feeling uneasy and then we start to feel more confident. But that can take a bit of time, right? So 
it's probably not until mid or late 2021 20, uh, where we'll start to see stock levels finally increase. And of course, then the concern is if stock levels tick up um, higher at a, at a fast rate, will there be enough demand to absorb that higher level of supply? Well, I think by that stage, you know, if that doesn't occur until mid to late 2021, um, by that stage, we're probably through the COVID period. People have recovered, government has stimulated, etc., cetera, uh, and the economy is sort of back on its feet. It probably will then, at that point, uh, there'll be enough demand to uh, fully uh, absorb all that supply. So I think the, the fact that supply is lower uh, and whilst might start trending upwards will remain below uh, what is normal uh, for at least the rest of this year and probably well into 2021. Uh, that also will probably lead to higher prices. As people become impatient, a little bit of FOMO and uh, they might be prepared to pay an extra ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 just to get into the property market. The third element is government spending and stimulus. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about the September fiscal cliff, they call it, when JobKeeper and loan repayment pauses were set to mature. But both these measures have been extended and I'm confident that there really won't be any mass selling of property as a result of COVID. There's nothing I know about today that kind of suggests that that's going to occur. Of course, if there's a third wave or a fourth wave or a fifth wave or who knows what it is, you know, if something like that comes out of left field, anything is possible, of course, but there's nothing that we know of today, I think, that suggests there's going to be some mass selling. The federal government will release its budget on the 6th of October, and I think we should prepare for a bit of a spending spree. So I think JobKeeper will be in place for as long as it's needed. For example, I think hospitality operators in Melbourne will probably need it the longest, uh, but probably... Uh, less so in other states. Uh, Government will spend big on infrastructure. They have to, to create jobs. I think there's likely to be targeted campaigns like uh, the UK has had, uh, which they called Eat Out to Help Out, which was really trying to get people back into restaurants. They've obviously canned that now because um, the virus is uh, coming back with a bit of a vengeance. But in that situation, the UK paid uh, up to 50% of your bill, up to £10, Uh, in terms of value if you went out to eat out. Uh, And it's a great way of of providing very targeted stimulus, but also getting people out there to create that demand. Uh, You know, a few weeks ago, the Australian government sold $21 billion of bonds that mature in 10 years' time at an interest rate of only 1%. Uh, So uh, there's a a theory around, it's called modern monetary theory, which suggests that, you know, government's, shouldn't worry about balancing a budget and should just borrow to uh, achieve economic outcomes. Uh, Let's put that aside whether we agree or disagree with that, but the fact is that money is cheap and I think that uh, the government government is now in a situation where it can borrow a lot of money to stimulate the economy and I think that the issue is that most economists agree that the cost of not helping the the economy recover from COVID is far greater than the burden of higher future government debt. Uh, So in short, they should be borrowing and they should be borrowing significantly and they should be helping the economy get back on its feet to get over this COVID issue, uh, which really wasn't an economic systemic issue. It's really a a left field, one in a hundred years type of event. Uh, Fourth issue, uh, population growth will bounce back strongly and I think we will start to form a view on that Uh, as we get deeper into next year, and that will then drive demand for property values. Uh, Look, I think um, obviously COVID has been a negative impact for um, overseas immigration. It's, you know, zero at the moment. Uh, And so, and and when that will bounce back, who who really knows? Probably next year, I would anticipate at some time, Uh, but perhaps it could uh, take even longer than that. But I think when all all is uh, said and done and we can think about a world that, that is post-COVID, uh, I think when um, you know people in China, for example, or India start to think about immigrating outside of their own country, uh, they would typically compare countries like the UK, the US, Australia and maybe Canada. Uh, and I think uh, Canada and Australia are going to fare pretty well um, or compare pretty well from an economic standpoint, but also from a safety standpoint, I think we'll be seen as a very safe place to immigrate to. Uh, 
in the main handled the uh, virus well and, and, and did well compared to, certainly compared to the UK and the US. And so I think if you think about immigration or demand for immigration to Australia over, say, the next 10 year period, so instead of focusing over the next couple of years, which is going to be negative, but as people start to look further afield, you know, I think that it could be in a situation where whilst we are certainly well under immigration levels for the next couple of years, that we could potentially more than make up for it over the rest of the, de- the decade. Uh, and that's going to provide uh, further stimulus for, you know, further demand, I should say, for renters, for, for rented housing, uh, and then also for property, uh, property ownership itself. Uh, so whilst COVID's been a negative for immigration, I think if we t- play that long game, I think COVID could actually end up being something that stimulates Austra- immigration to Australia. Finally, a couple of observations. Firstly, you've got to be aware of situation where we have temporarily overinflated values because of the restriction in supply. So um, what can happen, I've certainly seen happen, is that if demand for property bounces back very strongly, uh, but there are only a handful of properties for a sale in any particular location or type of asset, what you might see is people starting to pay ridiculous prices for those assets. Now, if you're buying a quality property in a quality location, you should always make friends with being prepared to pay fair market value for that property. So you're probably never going to get a deal or a bargain. Uh, and if you if you are going to get a bargain, it's more uh, as a result of random luck being in the right place at the right time rather than design. So make friends with having to pay fair market value for a property and, and be realistic about that. But be careful not to overpay, to, to think, oh, if I don't get in today, uh, that I'll, you know, that as prices keep rising, I have to pay a lot more next year. You may, but also if it's just, if it's um, uh, prices are inflated just because of supply, just because you've got some people that have the capacity or willingness to pay more, overpay for that property, doesn't necessarily mean those uh, purchases will be present for the rest of the time. And perhaps in those situations, waiting for a little bit more stock, for things to normalise a little bit, sometimes that's a better strategy. The other observation is that if we start looking at property data uh, at a, at a um, capital city level, uh, we might not see what I'm suggesting that I anticipate. So what could happen is because COVID has impacted income earners to a, a, a different extent, uh, and different occupations to a different extent, we could see a two-speed market. So we could see that the blue chip quality inner city areas are doing really well, um, but the areas that are um, that that have more lower income earners or attract more lower income earners, maybe they could struggle or at least not do as well as those inner city locations. Not suggesting it's going to happen, but if we have a think about how COVID has impacted the economy and the and the community. Uh, that is a possible outcome. And lastly, just a quick thought, it really doesn't matter in the long run. What matters is buying the right asset uh, in the right location with the right fundamentals. That is far more important than if you purchased at the beginning of this year, whether you purchase in the next couple of months, or in fact, whether you wait two years to make that purchase. In the long run, it's really not going to make any difference. So don't antagonise over it uh, too much. Don't stress over it. It's really not a big deal. But I thought it would be interesting just to kind of share my view in regards to the property markets and predictions. Uh, And it's interesting to start seeing some economists actually coming out, maybe taking more longer term views, you know, what prices might do over the next two or three years, starting to agree that the market's probably primed for a, uh, a pretty strong recovery for all the reasons that I've just spoken about. Anyway, that's uh, my predictions. Let's uh, circle back in 12, 18 months' time, see if I was right. Uh, And until next week, bye for now.